and just a few opening comments, kind of laying the uh, procedures, uh, ground rules, so to speak, for today. Um, this is the public comment hearing this February 2nd, 2022, uh, pursuant to the requirements of the Oklahoma Administrative Procedures Act for the following rule that's located in Title 210 of the Oklahoma Administrative Code. Uh, Title 210 is the Oklahoma State Department of Education. Uh, these are the um, rules relating to prohibition of race or sex discrimination. Notice of rulemaking intent for these rules was published in the January 3rd, 2022 edition of the Oklahoma Register. That would be at volume 39, number 8. I'd like to welcome everyone here. Thank you for taking time to join us today. My name is Brad Clark, uh, General Counsel with the Oklahoma Department, excuse me, Oklahoma State Department of Education. Uh, my job here today is to listen and receive the public comments being provided on these rules. This is, in essence, your opportunity to uh, provide comments on the administrative record relating to the uh, rules I mentioned a moment ago. In addition to this hearing, there are other ways that you can submit public comments on these rules, and I can tell you um, that that is being taken advantage of. Uh, those other opportunities are through email, uh, but you can also hand deliver comments here today if you would like. Today is the last day of public comment uh, under the period that was provided in the Oklahoma Register. And after today, we will begin the process of reviewing and considering all public comments on these rules. Come on in, sir. Any rules the State Board of Education approved uh, for adoption are then submitted to the governor's office and the legislature for approval in accordance with the Oklahoma Administrative Procedures Act. These comments are being recorded so they can be made a part of the official administrative record for these rules. We will also make a recording of this hearing available to the board members and um, they will be voting on these rules at a, a subsequent date. Very basic ground rules uh, as provided in the uh, Oklahoma Register we will be providing a time limit for comments and that time period uh, time limitation is four minutes and so we will notify you as we get closer upon that four minute period uh, so it's four minutes per comment uh, let's make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to provide the comments and don't forget you can also provide written comments to us should you hit that four minute mark so you can supplement for the record if you'd like to but you have to do that by 4 30 p.m today when you come up to speak, please state your name and the name of who you are representing if you are with an organization. And also, um, well, that won't apply here, but uh, there's only one rule up for public comment today. So I think we all know what rule we're, we're here to address, right? Uh, last thing before we begin, please take a moment, silence any electronic devices you have. That way the record is, is clear, crisp, and clean. Um, so without anything else, Let's go ahead and start. Uh, I believe John Gwynn is first up. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. As you said, my name's John Gwynn. I'm with Convention of States here in Oklahoma. And my comments were 30 years ago, the lines between parenting and education were identifiable and defined. Parents from the beginning taught their children that they were loved what was hazardous, what was safe, what was right, and what was wrong. They taught them how to share, to be polite, to show respect for others. They began to teach them in the alphabet, the numbers, basic reading, enjoying stories. They learned morality from religious teachings, and it was also their first exposure to history. Parents relied on schools to build on these life skills, from counting to 100 at home, to learning basic math functions early, and continuing over the years to calculus to take them from reading Dick and Jane at home to eventually reading and appreciating the classics such as Melville and Tolstoy. From basic English skills to English composition to writing their own stories. Schools would expose them to the history of our nation, both the good and the bad, as well as the history of the world. They would grow from learning about nature at home, from learning science, biology, chemistry, zoology. They learned civics to understand how our nation was born and how it functions. These were lofty ideals, and it took an admirable person to take these daunting tasks on at historically low-paying positions. Parent and teachers worked together to ensure the best possible outcomes for the children. Somehow these lines have become blurred in the past several years and have now been obliterated. 
I feel some teachers deliberately usurp the role of the parents by declaring them ignorant and out of touch. Teachers are held in high esteem by our children, rightfully so, for those that deserve it, which I still feel most teachers do. But the few who are given to a personal agenda to indoctrinate our children into their world as a higher calling than the noble cause of educating our children with the skills that they need to build careers and support their own families. These teachers are the poison apples in the bushel. These teachers have now made it a personal mission to politically and socially indoctrinate our most precious resource, our children, into radicals to carry a distorted view of society and the world. They openly discuss their own sexuality with the students. They discuss Marxist, Marxist social dogma, social equity, not equality, and other divisive viewpoints. Dr. King would be horrified how his cause has been hijacked. If books have been introduced to our schools at a very early age that are beyond the pale as to what is acceptable for young minds, just as we developed ratings for the entertainment industry to define what age is appropriate for viewing, these books should be defined and absolutely no ju uh, justification for being found in our public school libraries. Books that cover rape, masturbation, LGBTQ conversion are not topics for our kids to be taught. Morality begins at home and at a church, and is further learned by our children as they learn history and the mistakes mankind has made. History is there to reveal our mistakes, to learn from those mistakes and not repeat them. Revisionist his history teaches social indoctrination. Sprinkling some facts into a story doesn't make it history, just a little more convincing of an argument with a false story. Politicians learned this long ago. Now some radical teachers are adopting the same method. It's time for parents to stand up, show up, and speak up for their rights and for the children's rights, to demand that radical teachers be held accountable and that schools employ them if their activity is known to administration to be accountable too. I was a teacher myself for 12 years, and it was one of the most rewarding ventures I have ever had the pleasure of experiencing. It is a most noble profession that is being hijacked for subversive personal goals by a few bad apples. I represent Convention of States in Oklahoma, and we support parents' rights, and we will fight to protect our great state and our most precious resource, our children, from the social and political indoctrination. We have over 47,000 petition signers in Oklahoma, and we have a loud voice. We will not quietly allow this perversion of our youth to continue. It's time to shine the light on this topic <clears throat> and for accountability for those guilty of tarnishing this noble occupation. And I'm also submitting the permanent rules which we wish to see imposed for the administration of 1775. Thank you. All right, uh, I believe Ms. Cox. Thank you for your time. My name is Tamaya Cox Trey. I am the executive director of the ACLU of Oklahoma. And in full transparency, starting off, ACLU of Oklahoma Foundation is one of the several organizations that is challenging um, 1775. The ACLU of Oklahoma is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization devoted to exclusively to the defense and promotion of the ind individual rights secured by the US and Oklahoma constitutions. During the 2021 session, the Oklahoma legislature followed the ill-advised national trend of prohibiting divisive concepts at both the university and the secondary school level. This policy was not developed by Oklahoma educators, did not consider the important history of Oklahoma that would be excluded from the academic framework, and failed to consider the voices of students who would be receiving a subpar education if this board allows for these classroom censorship policies to be implemented. Um, we really want to talk quickly about just two uh, major concerns for us. These rules provide little guidance on curriculum. Um, the ACLU, as well as other many organizations, highlighted the many problems of House Bill 1775, specifically pointing out the unconstitutionally vague language that gives little to no guidance on the allowable curriculum. At the very best, teachers will have to blindly use their discretion on what is permissible under these rules, 
These de decisions will be made under the real threat of losing their teaching certificate if they violate these rules. And teachers will understandably err on the side of caution when developing their lessons plans. These, rules, these rule changes prevent students from maintaining any of the goals that have been set out by the Board of Education. This rule censors speech that strikes at the heart of public education and the nation's democratic um, institutions. School districts have already removed um, books from requiring reading lists um, in, uh, in response to um, this rule in House Bill 1775, including To Kill a Mockingbird, Their Eyes Are Watching God, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, and Raisin in the Sun. It is no coincidence that these authors are black and are women discussing various topics on race and their lived experiences. These books could spark conversations in the classroom settings and teachers are and should be prepared to facilitate and steer those com conversations in meaningful ways. Teachers have also been received guidance, teachers have also received guidance in order to comply with 1775 by avoiding terms such as diversity or white privilege. Um, again, these are prime examples of educators and administrators who are unable to decipher the vague and burdensome rule that has been placed by the Oklahoma legislature. Quickly, Oklahoma also has um, a unique perspective when it comes to the history involving black and brown um, and indigenous communities. Um, uh, schools should be a place where students can discuss and identify the systems that allowed these atrocities to happen, specifically around the Tulsa Race Massacre and uh, boarding schools. This department, we recognize that the Department of Ed has been in a precarious place, having to balance the will of the legislature and promulgate these rules. Um, Oklahoman students re should receive and must receive a comprehensive education free from censorship from this legislature. So we ask that this department rescind or amend uh, these proposed rules for these reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Wynn? No, I won't. No? Okay. No, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Mary Lippert, I believe, is next. Did I say that correctly? Mary Lippert? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Lippert, and I'm an Oklahoma City Public School graduate from K through college. Um, I put in July, and again wanted to share my thoughts today. Um, I have been complacent and complicit in where we are today in Oklahoma education. House Bill 1775 and the permanent rules to be adopted by the legislature were written and promulgated in an effort to prohibit stereotyping or bias in Oklahoma education, which because of our complacency has entered our education system via academia and what is referred to as critical race theory, SEL or social emotional learning, or social justice, and most recently, restorative justice. Martin Luther King, Thomas Sowell, Booker T. Washington, who collaborated, Booker T. Correct, collaborated to build over 500 schoolhouses, Robert Woodson, Clarence Thomas, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Frederick Douglass, Carol Swain, Ben Carson, all people who have experienced bias, stereotyping, and most certainly racism, yet they as individuals and as a group state they got to where they are in their careers and life because of values like resilience, fortitude, perseverance, determination, hard work, persistence, and persistence provided through education. The assault is on these values, not on systemic racism or white supremacy that truly undermines the prospects for success. Thomas Sowell stated in his book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, written in 2008, this country's racist past should never be forgotten or taken lightly, but neither should it be used as a blanket explanation for present disparities. History teaches us that progress of blacks and other minorities in the U.S. is not conditioned on racial tolerance. 
It's hard to understand why the current culture is much more interested in black and minority suffering than in their accomplishment. Black history is about more than victimization at the hands of whites. How does such an approach facilitate upward mobility? Shouldn't the focus be on what has been achieved, notwithstanding that victimization? There is, as we know, February is known as Black History Month. And to the chagrin of many of these same black leaders I just mentioned, including Robert Woodson, a civil rights activist in 1960s and founder of 1776, his curriculum should be considered for use in the schools, not just this month, but across the spectrum in the school year. My experience at Northwest Classen included Mr. Mott and AP History. The education I received in his classes encouraged a love for history. Think back to your favorite teacher or professor who was one that had the most impact on you as a young adult. Mine was Mr. Mott. In college, it was Baker Bocorny in my restaurant classes. How do you consider a mentor in your, who do you consider as a mentor? We're saying that this is only taught in the, at the college level. But if you spent hundreds of thousands of, tens of thousands of dollars on an education, you will probably take it into the classroom. You think of your mentor. You take the lesson plans. You take those lessons and... And I'm sorry, Ms. Lippert, it is time, so if you would, wrap your statement. Thank okay. You. As I said before, parents don't want this taught in their school, and there's a good reason that it's important to pass these permanent rules to protect our education system and children of Oklahoma by eliminating the discriminatory concepts prohibited by House Bill 1775 and the hopefully adopted permanent rules. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Walker? No? Were there any others? Uh, that is the end of the list, but if there were others I think may have come in, you're certainly welcome to go up and provide comments, but after you're done, if you would, sign in. And I apologize if uh, you did hear this, but if not, uh, there is a time limit of four minutes. And so I'll, as we get closer, I'll be holding up, you know, one minute left, 30 seconds left, and we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my name is J. Mark Owsley, and I've uh, been a certified Oklahoma teacher since 2009. I'm also a chapter leader for the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism um, that's committed to pro-human, uh, pro the promoting pro-human education. Um, and I just want to offer some evidence about what is being taught in Oklahoma public schools. On February 9, 2021, Norman, Norman Public School Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director Stephanie Williams published a mandatory virtual teacher training for all Norman Public School teachers and administrators. In this training, Ms. Williams stated that each and every teacher's commitment to equity as defined by Ibram X. Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is not optional and must be embedded in everything that they do. To define equity, Ms. Williams provided the following quote. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as racist or confronts racial inequities as anti-racist. This is a dichotomous Kafka trap that says either you support the policies we, per we want you to support from diversity, from their Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or you are a racist. This is a false choice. But more importantly, right next to that quote, she provides a graphic. And it's referred to as the growth zone of anti-racism that lists required actions that each and every teacher 
who does not belong to a historically marginalized group must take in order to fully com be, be fully compliant with DEI policy and practice. Here is the, that list of actions. I, number one, I surround myself with others who agree with this ideology, who think and look differently than me. This explicitly puts this in uh, a racial category or an identity-based category for one set of rules that applies to one group and not the other. I identify how I unknowingly benefit from racism, as defined by Kendi and Williams. And then, number three, I sit in an I sit with and internalize and accept as unquestionably right and necessary my never-ending discomfort. I don't let my racist mistakes, this is number four, I don't let my racist mistakes as defined by Kendi and Williams deter me from being better or doing the work. Number five, I speak out against racism, capital R, as defined by Kendi and Williams, which is denoted by the capital R, in action. Number six, I educate my peers how racism harms our profession, per, per, uh, harms our profession. Again, capital R. I, number seven, I yield positions of power to those otherwise historically marginalized. So you must, if you are a part of a, a historically oppressive group, you must yield your position of power in order to be anti-racist. And number eight, I promote and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist, as defined by Kendi and Williams. These actions are explicitly required not only, uh, to, uh, are explicitly required of only one identity group. To that, and, and many have uh, said that this, that Ibram Kendi is not a part of critical race theory, and to that I submit the following quote from him. I quote, so I've certainly been inspired by my critical race theory and critical race theorists, the same way I've formulated definitions of racism and racist, anti-racist and anti-racist. And that is from the podcast given in Slate, and this is the last thing I have to say. That, that explicitly makes the connection between Ibram Kendi's mode of action, which is uh, displaced uh, specifically in, in discrimination. Lest there be any doubt that the only prescribed policy mechanism needed to create equity via school policy, Kendi makes clear just paragraphs later in the same book used as the definition of what that mechanism is. He says, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. These rules must be passed to prevent this body and other similar local bodies and administrators from mandating CRT-derived discrimination-based school policies that are in direct violation of state and federal civil rights law. We must pass these rules to protect our students. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Mr. Uh, Walker? Yeah. Sure. And sir, if you don't mind, uh, gentleman that just spoke, if you would sign in, yes. just so we have it for the record. Thank you. I just is passing by. My name is Tom Walker, and uh, I'm just curious what you people are so paranoid about. Why are you uh, scared of history? Well, I just don't understand this. You know, your worldview is uh, dangerous, arrogant, and paranoid, and you think that's helpful for your kids? Please. I prefer to communicate the reality rather than the well-oiled myths of poverty, racism, and exploitation, which you people are perpetuating here today. And that's, you're doing a disservice to your kids and to everybody else in Oklahoma. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any others? Public comments? Go ahead. Either way, it's up to you. Thank you, though. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Jasmine Brown Jutris. I also am with the ACLU of Oklahoma. Um, I actually did not plan to speak today. Um, but I did feel compelled to join after hearing some remarks today. I first want to start with um, parents, teachers, 
boards, whoever it is choosing these students' educations and what they should hear, making these decisions without students or hearing the impact of what's happening to them in the classroom does not do this process justice. So I thought that it was important to talk today uh, to just say a few comments. One, starting with what do students want in the classroom? What do students feel safe with? And what makes a holistic education for them? And students, and this is coming from, this is a quote from an educator, Anthony Crawford, here in Oklahoma City Public Schools. He said, my students are the ones who want to talk about race and gender because their issues, these are their issues that they deal with in their everyday lives. Regardless of what people think of the past, it happened. And it affects people and it affects students every single day. Racism still lives in their classroom. Sexism still lives in the classroom and at home. And it is our duty as a state and our duty as advocates to make sure that students' voices are heard and that they know that they are loved. Regardless of if you are happy with what reality we live in now, this is the reality. Students have identities that they need to express and that they need to be loved in. And we need to be making sure that we are providing a holistic education, not forgetting the native history that we live on that you, we are looking, if this is proposed as the way that this legislation is written, if it is implemented in the classroom the way it is written, we are forgetting Native history. We are le leaving out the true history of what happened here on Native land in Oklahoma. We are leaving out the true history that happened in Tulsa when a race massacre happened and not hundreds but thousands were killed on 40 square feet, 40 square miles of land. I understand that moving into the future and understanding that times are changing can be hard, but what I cannot, what I cannot understand and what I cannot accept is that you, we as adults, we as educators, we as mentors will not move with them forward. As life is changing, as these student lives are changing, we have to move forward and give them support, give them love. Whether you like the past or not, it happened. And it's time to move forward and provide these students with the care, the love, and support that they need, whether we like it or not, or you like it or not. So I repeat, continuing this process and allowing for 1775 to go into effect the way that these, this law was originally proposed, it is damaging the lives of students in the classroom. We have to do better. We have to offer a full, holistic classroom learning space without censorship. Thank you, that is my time. Thank you. Are there any others who wish to make public comment? Seeing none, um, I will hang around for a few more minutes in case anyone arrives, but um, we will adjourn, excuse me, adjourn this hearing uh, very shortly. Thank you all. Thank you. Sure. My name is Kathy Logie. Dipping enrollment leads to suspensions of education preparation programs. This is from an article there from that. Uh, this was News 9. Then there's the CARES Act and ESSER funds provided in the amount of 255 million OKCPS in which 65% of stakeholders think should go to quality teachers. But there are strings attached. They must be spent utilizing an equity lens as the district's DEI assistant superintendent states during the November 2021 work session in which an explanation of how the money would be spent to help with lost learning. This is in a district that is 80% color and less than 20% Caucasian. Open your eyes and look at the student population. Don't focus on limiting those 20%. The Oklahoma City Public Schools should have their lens on the other 80% number that are not proficient in math, reading, which happens to be all but five schools in the district serving students K through eight. 
Chief diversity officers, CDOs, have become increasingly common in K through 12 school districts, with almost 40% of districts that enroll at least 15,000 15, students listing a CDO on their websites. While CDOs are meant to close achievement gaps, Heritage Foundation Research finds that districts with CDOs have larger gaps and that they are growing wider. Oklahoma City Public Schools published scorecard of 33 schools in, in Oklahoma City Public School. Five different district. I'm sorry. Five schools rate 35 to 50 percent proficiency in reading and/or math. 15 schools are at 10 percent profi proficiency or below. Thank you. Thank you. If you would please do sign in up here. Sure, and I saw. Uh, someone walk in if you would like to provide comment. Go right ahead. Either before or after, it's up to you. Four. And, and if you hit the four minute timer, as I reminded earlier, you can supplement those with written comments. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready. Our state and country are currently standing on a precipice. Will cultural constructivism, better known as critical race theory or critical social justice, push us over the edge into chaos? Or will we step back and evaluate the consequences of our actions? Before I go on, I'd like to briefly discuss liberalism versus cultural constructivism. Liberalism is rooted in objective reality. There is truth outside of our head. Truth is consistent from person to person and across cultures. Liberalism acknowledges individual free thought, free consciousness, free speech. Individual identity is highly varied. We all want love, accomplishment, friends, and that language has an objective meaning and represents objective reality or the essence of an idea or object is part of liberalism. The word is, div is divine if true. Concepts such as free thought, science, enlightenment, reasoning, equal treatment before the law, neutral constitutional principles, human rights are true and lead to social justice and power for people and societies that adopt them. Cultural constructivism or critical race theory or critical social justice relies on subjective reality. That truth cannot be known by the human mind. A true statement is a socially valid statement about reality. Reality is now a construct of the socially powerful or power dynamic. Power controls language, narrative, who decides what is true and how we talk about truth, discourse around knowledge, to build socially constructed truths for the benefit of the powerful. Concepts such as science, enlightenment, reasoning, equal treatment before the law, neutral constitutional principles, human rights are untrue and a system of oppression. Critical social justice strives to dismantle and replace the systems of oppression by dismantling liberalism and objective truth. Diversity, equity, and inclusion and transformative social emotional learning, or SEL as they are today, are the mechanisms to do that in education and most organizations. But the argument that <clears throat> It is not taught in Oklahoma classrooms is false. My son and daughter have both been subjects of school surveys asking them their perceptions of gender and racial identities and whether or not they identify as the race or gender they were assigned at birth. Also, racial discrimination questions meant to emphasize group identity, race, gender, or sexuality is a construct of socialization clearly from the philosophy of cultural constructivism and meant to upend their religious beliefs and self-identity, all without parental consent. My son, now a junior, has seen AP classes removed from his curriculum and instead forced to take an interdisciplinary studies course, leveraging honors, history, and English as the credits he receives. Within the framework of this class, he is not given any history or English assignments, but instead learning subjective narratives and Marxist ideology as design systems and power dynamics, as well as Harkness discussions in class via equity mapping, points being allotted to the students by which group speaks more, boys or girls, white or black, or historical marginalized, not the individual. You are only as good as your group, not individual talent or knowledge. No syllabus, textbooks, or instructional materials were ever sent home or given in advance. He has increased anxiety when midterms and finals are looming because he has no idea what the test will cover, except that he understands the result is to socially activate him to a purpose antithetical to individual values and beliefs. To give more context to where this ends, just look to where the university graduate is today. 
They are called critical social justice activists with no real knowledge to get a good paying job or real life skills. They are focused on protests and tearing down Western civilization or liberalism. We are decimating the middle class, creating a generation dependent on government welfare because their education failed them and they have no chance to earn a decent living or support a family. This is not the future I would like for my children or grandchildren and I know you also feel the same. This is not what my immigrant parents or grandparents would want either. Please preserve our future, support and pass the rules as amended for House Bill 1775, and let true liberalism flourish free of cultural constructivism and identity politics. Thank you.